Well, hello and welcome again to Word for the Week, the uh, online uh, video study series from Cornerstone Faith Community Church. My name is Pastor Jeremy Heidkamp, and I'm very happy to be with you uh, today as we continue our look through uh, this book by Jerry Bridges called The Discipline of Grace. The Discipline of Grace. We are <clears throat> on chapter 5 uh, this week. And uh, hopefully you found that this chapter was a bit less uh, intense than chapter four. It's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a significant amount less theologically minded and much more focused on the reality of grace in our life. And um, I, I hope that you uh, enjoy this chapter a lot. Um, I want to begin today, if you would, at, uh, in, in, in Titus, Paul's letter to Titus. Um, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. Now, um, if you've got your uh, Discipline by Grace book in front of you, um, Jerry Bridges actually has that printed on the first uh, page of chapter 5. Um, Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12 read this way. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age. The grace of God that brings salvation, the grace of God that gave us the love of Jesus Christ, that gave us the, the blessing of Jesus Christ, that gave us the, uh, the salvation, the, the life eternal, the access to forgiveness that Jesus brings us, that grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He has indeed. Jesus has appeared to all men. Um, now, we might argue that a little bit because some of us would say, well, we I've never seen Jesus. Have you ever seen Jesus? And the reality is we haven't seen him in person. We have, however, seen his spirit. We have seen him by the, the power of the Holy Spirit, which was a gift that he promised to us from God his Father um, before he ascended into heaven. We have seen his work in our lives. We have seen the beauty of forgiveness. We uh, know by God's word the truth of salvation and life eternal. And so in those ways, we have absolutely seen him. We also have seen him in the word uh, that God has given to us. He's told us so much about uh, Jesus and about his desire for a personal relationship with us. And uh, so we have seen him. He's appeared to all men. And then Titus, uh, Paul says to Titus, it teaches us, that being the grace of God, that brings salvation, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions in order that we would be able to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And that's really what we're going to focus on, the ability to live these um, self-controlled, upright, and godly lives instead of worldly, wicked passions. And so if you'll turn with me to uh, page 74 of Bridges' book, uh, right under the heading, Salvation and Discipline are Inseparable, uh, he writes these words. Another truth we see in Titus 2, 11 through 12 is that salvation and spiritual discipline are inseparable. The grace that belongs to salvation, I'm sorry, the grace that brings salvation to us also disciplines us. The grace that brings us salvation also disciplines us. It does not do one without the other. That is, God never saves people and then leaves them alone to continue in their immaturity and sinful lifestyle. Those whom he saves, he disciplines. Paul said this another way in Philippians 1 and 6, he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, a little bit uh, later on, uh, in the book here, Bridges is going to ask uh, three questions that we should be considering. The first question is, are you really trusting Jesus as your Savior? The second, is there any evidence in your life that you have died to the reign of sin through, the, through your dying like Jesus did on the cross, through the death of Jesus Christ? Is there any evidence of that in your life? And then thirdly, is the grace of God a, a work within you to discipline you, to train you up for righteousness? 
Um, and so I want to look at those three particular questions today. Are you really trusting Jesus? Is there evidence in your life that you desire to die to sin or you have died to sin? And then is the grace of God working in your life um, to, to discipline you or train you up? And at page 75, middle of the page, uh, middle or so of the second paragraph, it says um, about uh, folks who have come and claimed to have trusted in Jesus Christ. Maybe you could picture in your mind like a, a Billy Graham crusade or something of that nature where people are encouraged to come forward and profess faith in Jesus Christ, uh, accept Jesus as their savior. He writes this, uh, Bridges writes this, they may have walked an aisle, signed a card, or even prayed a prayer, but grace is not teaching them to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, let alone to live self-controlled, uh, upright, and godly lives. Essentially, their lives are no different today than they were before they professed to have trusted Jesus Christ. And as I was reading that, um, this thought came to my mind, you know, why, why would a person go through the hassle, walk through the motions? Um, ha I guess going through the hassle isn't maybe the best way to put it, but why would a person walk through the process of accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, especially in a public way, like coming forward in a church service or at a revival or something like that, and have no intention on living like they really trust him, living like they really need him. Um, this boggles my mind. Um, why do people want to pretend that they need Jesus? Why do people want to pretend that they need his grace and his salvation? Um, yet at the same time, the reality is this, that in every one of our churches uh, across this great globe on a Sunday morning or whenever we meet for worship, there are people who walk through the doors of our churches. They have no more intent on trusting Jesus, following Jesus, living, loving Jesus, being disciplined by the grace that he offers us than any other person. They, they just have no intention to do that. Yet, their intention is to make every person around them believe that they trust Jesus as their personal savior. It's such an, uh, a, a contradiction or an, uh, an oxymoron. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And that's the first question that we talked about. Are you really trusting Jesus as your Savior? Or are you just filling out the card? Are you just raising your hand? Are you just coming forward? Are you, uh, are you just walking through this process to make it look like you're trusting Jesus? At the bottom of page 75, uh, Bridges says, The sobering truth should be reflected upon by each of us. Is God's grace disciplining me? The Apostle Paul said, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? And the Apostle Peter exhorted us to be all the more eager to make our calling and election sure. And so are you truly trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior as he is presented in the gospel? And that's a difficult question for us. Um, we never want to be that person who's just walking through the motions. We always want to be the one who is really, truly, honestly, fervently trusting Jesus. And there's a big discrepancy there. The second question, of course, then was, is there any evidence in your life that you have actually died to sin? We talked a lot last week. That was that theological discussion we had last week about dying to sin, what it actually means. Um, but there should be evidence of that. And that's where the discipline of grace comes in. The evidence that I truly don't want to be living in sin. I truly don't want to be living counter to God's will for me. I truly don't want to be living without Jesus, without God, without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. If those things are true for me, then the fruit of that, the truth of that, the thing that proves that is the fact that I have died to sinfulness in my life. It still exists in my life, but I don't want it. I don't choose it. I don't want it. It's, it's things that are, that are unavoidable. They're, they're human nature. They're ways we continue to sin because humans are sinful. We will always be sinful until Jesus makes all things right someday. But the difference is I don't 
want to be that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to say that. I don't want to think that. I don't want to whatever. And so is there evidence then in your life that you've died? Is there evidence? Is there something that'll prove it? That's the discipline of, the discipline of grace. You know, all the things that we're called to. Yes, um, reading our Bibles, uh, quiet time, conversation with God, um, serving our church, all those things. And remember, those things don't bring us salvation, but they are fruit. They are proof. They are evidence that we truly do trust God. We truly do love him. We truly, truly do receive his gift of Jesus Christ as our Savior and trust him fully. And we truly do want to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so is there any evidence that you've died to sin? Well, the evidence would be this discipline of grace. That grace moves in me and tells me, don't do that. Don't do that. Do that. Definitely do that. Don't do that. You get the point. There's fruit. There's proof in our life that we have died to sin. The last question then quickly is, is the grace of God? at work in you to discipline or train you so that you are growing spiritually. If the discipline of grace is not in our lives, we will not grow. We will not grow in Jesus. We will not grow even really better as a person. We will not grow in our spiritual knowledge and understanding of who God is, what he's done for us. Interestingly enough, at the top of page 78, Bridges writes this. He says, when we trust in Christ as our Savior, we bring a habit of ungodliness into our Christian lives. Uh, what does he mean by a habit of ungodliness? <coughs> our lives, apart from Jesus, apart from Christ, apart from the love of God in our lives, apart from the movement and the power of the Holy Spirit, our lives are going to naturally be ungodly. Now, that doesn't mean that um, if we have uh, just a simple trust in, you know, that God exists or something of that nature, we're suddenly made godly. We, are, are, we, we, we transition from that ungodliness into sort of the righteous um, in this big trajectory of growth that goes, you know, um, that, that just really goes like this, essentially. And um, if that trajectory of growth sort of stops someplace or, or doesn't actually ever get started, it's probably because we've brought the pattern of the ungodliness in our lives into our relationship with Jesus Christ. So we have stained it. We have um, caused it to become something that it should never be. Um, as I was reading that sentence, that when we trust in Christ as our Savior, we bring a habit of ungodliness into our Christian lives, I thought this. We tend to live in this habit of ungodliness. We tend to live lives that are more influenced by the world, uh, wickedness, sinfulness, uh, our human natures, than influenced by God, Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when we choose to leave that all behind, and we choose to trust Jesus Christ fully. We choose to trust God fully and love God fully and, and serve him and obey him as completely as we can. What we're doing is we're actually bringing a sacrifice to him. We are sacrificing this life of ungodliness that we knew that I suppose we could even say we loved at some level. We, we participated in, um, maybe enjoyed, but, but this level, this habit, this life of ungodliness, we bring it as a sacrifice onto the altar, essentially, um, uh, to, be, to be given up as, as a fragrant offering um, before the Lord. And this is that idea of a sacrifice of praise. Um, in Hebrews 13 and 15, 13 and 15, Hebrews 13 and 15, we read about bringing a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And I've always thought, Okay, I, I think I understand this sacrifice of praise idea, but why are we calling praise a sacrifice? Isn't praise a privilege? Isn't praise an honor? Isn't it my, my privilege, my honor, my duty, my responsibility, my, 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 my response to God when I praise him? Yes, but it is also a reality that when we praise, we are sacrificing something. Not something good in our lives. It's terribleness. But we still have to give up that something in order to praise God. And so 
we sacrifice this habit of ungodliness in order that the grace of God would be at work in us to discipline us so that we can grow spiritually. I hope that helps to, um, you to understand a little bit more about uh, what Bridges is writing here in the Discipline of Grace this week. Uh, I want to just leave you with this thought then from page 86, the very end of the chapter. It says, remember, the grace that brought you salvation is the same grace that teaches you but you must respond on the basis of grace, not law. That's why you've got to preach the gospel to yourself every day. We've got to respond to the truth of salvation with grace, not with law. This can't be something that if I don't do the, these five things, God won't love me. God won't accept me. I won't have eternal life. It doesn't work that way. But on the other hand, those five things, God does want you to do as you grow, as you sacrifice that habit of ungodliness. And so um, this is a great word about the salvation being our teacher today. Hope you've enjoyed this. I will see you next week as we look at chapter six, uh, where Bridges talks about being transformed into his likeness, transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ more and more each and every day. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.